Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out today. I'm a bit surprised and disappointed that Victoria didn't have a massive demonstration, but this is uh, because, folks, we've run out of time. We have no time left for real action. That's what Greta's been saying since she shot into Providence. We don't have time. And yet, how many years have gone by since she began to make her message global? What is it? So I, as I listen to the speeches here, we can't go on getting caught up in these specific issues which are all symptomatic of something deep under, underneath that's impelling us on this destructive, this destructive path. I am talking to you as a total failure that I've spent my life trying to find what the key is and we haven't been able to make the changes. And so let's think hard about what the problem is. For most of human history, we have understood that we were deeply embedded in a web of relationships with all other species of animals and plants, with air, water, soil, and sunlight. That has been our understanding because for 95% of our existence on Earth, we were nomadic hunter-gatherers. We had to follow the animals on their migrations. We had to look through the seasons for something good to eat. We understood that we were deeply embedded in the natural world. And when you have that feeling, you know that in a web, even though we're one strand in that web, whatever we do ripples through the web. And so you hear from indigenous people over and over, there's a responsibility that comes with being a part of that web, with receiving the, the generosity. And that's what's so terrifying about what we're seeing today. The anti-vaxxers, the freedom movement, these truckers, all about freedom. Freedom without responsibility is not freedom, that's anarchy. So the, the problem is, for the last thousand years, we've gradually removed ourselves from the natural world. We think that we're at the top of a pyramid. We're not in a web, we're at the top, and it's all about us. And the systems that we've developed to have transactions, to interact with each other, our legal, our economic, and our political systems are all designed around us. It's about us, and guess what? Nature was left out. And nothing illustrates that better than Mark Carney's latest book, Values, in which he points out that Amazon, Jeff Bezos' giant company is valued by the economy in the tens of billions, while Amazon, the greatest ecosystem on the planet, is valued by the, uh, by the economy as zero until people go in and log it, mine it, dam it, burn it, develop cities, or grow soybeans. That's the whole rot that's at the heart of these structures that we've developed. You know, our legal system, it's all about us and borders around property and cities and, and nations. Do you think nature cares about the boundaries that we draw? It was, it was Swedish scientists who announced a spike of radioactivity that must have come from Ukraine. Why? There was, must have been a, an accident in Chernobyl and air doesn't stay with, within national boundaries. Something that Daniel Smith ought to learn a bit more about. Air doesn't belong to us. We are, and, our, and who the hell do we think we are thinking we can give the right for existence? What about the right of a bird to live its life as it evolved to live? The right of a river to flow? Or the right of a forest to exist as a community of organisms? Who the hell do we think we are? We fought, the David Suzuki Foundation fought for seven years to try to get the right to a healthy environment enshrined in our Constitution. Seven years later, it's finally in there. It's not in the Constitution. We're supposed to be grateful uh, for doing it. But our legal system, everything, and I heard someone here saying they found something in the legal system to try to, to uh, uh, save Ferry Creek, and I hope it works. But the legal system is already imbalanced and it's all because it's all about us 
and the way that we interact with each other. And nature is just a subsidiary of the place that we live. And of course, the thing that is driving us now is the economy. The economy is what, you know, Mr. Harper for nine and a half years told us, we can't do anything about global warming. That's crazy economics. No, uh, sorry, it's, uh, it, it's the economy that's crazy, not dealing with climate change. But you see, in that statement, he elevated the economy above the very atmosphere that gives us air to breathe, that gives us weather, climate, and the seasons. The economy is more important. And we're all caught up in that. We're all consumers and we're a part of that economy that is consuming the earth to death. And we, uh, well, no, I take that back. Earth isn't in trouble. No, we we're are. in trouble. <laughs> the planet will go on doing whatever it does with or without us. But the biosphere that is is uh, immicable for human life will be radically uh, changed. And of course, our political system, I do not believe that the people that we are electing to office are stupid or greedy or evil. I don't believe that. They're trapped within the system. The system, and that's why I just met a, a, a member of parliament from BC who's now a, a liberal, he's a part of the government I met. He has supported me and the David Suzuki Foundation for years. I went up to him and I said, look, you guys are in power. Why the hell haven't you declared a, a global emergency on climate and, and now get everybody in to work on this? This is far more serious than COVID, the COVID outbreak. And his answer was, well, if we do that, Poliev will get elected. So no, but that shows you He's trapped within the system where politics is more important than doing what has to be done. This is the problem. And, and to make it worse, to make it worse, we've met with our environment minister here. He's a good guy. Wasn't he the head of the Sierra Club, British Columbia? He knows what the issues are. And so then when we said, well, George, uh, what about the, the mining that's going on? He said, oh, I'm sorry, that's not in my portfolio. Sell out, sell and then we said, well, what about the forestry practice? He said, oh, that's not in my portfolio. Well, what about the energy that's going, being developed over uh, at Site C? Oh, well, that's again, that's energy. What the hell is he the minister of? <laughs> we think that we can look at the world in bits and pieces and manage it in a way that makes any kind of sense. The systems that we're trapped in are the problem. People ask me, well, what can we do then? Short of revolution, which is what we, is it possible to have a peaceful revolution? We've got to push every metric that we can, I think, without uh, end endangering or threatening humans, I guess. But uh, <laughs> so to me, civil disobedience is, is where we all have to be looking at. But most important, I think, we all claim that we elect politicians to look out for us then we bloody well better tell them what they are looking out for. And it's not re-election. It's to do the right thing now. So we've got we've to tell them. So I beg every one of you, I beg every one of you, write at, or call at least once a week. Doesn't matter what party, just call and tell people who are now in office what our priorities must be. And believe me, if they get one or two calls, it's dismissed. If they start getting 100 calls, they're gonna jump up and down and pay attention. Yes. When, yes. when Al Gore was elected uh, as a vice president with, with Bill Clinton, for some reason I had, I mean, he's been a friend, but I had his phone number, I called him <laughs> the day he got elected, and to my shock, he picked up the phone. And we had, a, you know, everyone was excited, and I congratulated, I said, Al, what can we do in Canada to get people like you elected to office? And his answer was, don't look to me. He said, if you want change, you've got to mobilize the public, get them to recognize there is a problem, get them to see where there are solutions, and then get them to demand it. And that's what we have to do now. Doesn't matter what party, we want change. We want our governments to do the right thing and the governments for everybody. Look at what we did during COVID, for God's sake. 
You know, we've gone to Ottawa year after year begging for a few million dollars for public transit and ins home insulation and all that, being told over and over again, sorry, we don't have the money for that. COVID hits, where the hell did the money come from? <laughs> not millions, not hundreds of millions, Billions. but tens of billions of dollars. Yep. So it's not a matter, and we've seen with Trudeau, if he wants to build a pipeline, he'll invest $4 billion, and what? guess what? We owe $30 billion now. He doesn't care about the economy of that. There's money there, but let's demand it. This has got to be what we have to, we have to focus on now. Is the, the other thing, but the second thing is we're all caught up in that. We're all caught up in that. We're caught up in a global system where we as consumers now are a part of the destructive uh, powers. There's a very good group in, in England called JUMP, which I look to, that tells you what we can do as individuals in terms of transportation, in terms of housing, in terms of food, in terms of clothing. And, uh, you know, I'm a carbon sinner. I have flown a lot for filming with the nature of things. And uh, what uh, JUMP says is, Anybody now, if you want to make an impact in terms of transportation, take a short haul flight, that would be Vancouver to Calgary or Toronto to Montreal, once every three years. If you want to take a long haul flight from Toronto to Vancouver or from Toronto to Paris, once every seven years. The electric car is not the solution, right? The solution, of course, is the car is a problem. Whether it's electric or an ICE car, it, they're the problem. It's too much resources. Why should a, a one-ton vehicle transport my one and a half hundred pound ass from one place to another? All the energy is going to moving the car, for God's sake. Anyway, I'm just going all over. I, 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 I wrote a speech and then as I listened to the people, I, I said, no, no, I've got to do something else. Uh, but we, uh, we have to make our presence felt uh, politically and um, I think that we have to make our presence felt as consumers because consumption is now 70% of our economy. And I remember my parents who married during the Great Depression telling me over and over again growing up, Live within your means, save some for tomorrow, share, don't be greedy, help your neighbors, they're part of your community, and you have to work hard for money to buy the necessities in life. But you don't run after money as if having fancier clothes, the latest car, or a bigger computer, well, they didn't talk about computers back, a bigger house makes you a better, more important person. And we better think about that. When I, I got into a Walmart once in my life and it made me want to puke. How much of all that stuff at Walmart is a necessity? We're buying all these toys, these things just to amuse ourselves for a few minutes and then they'll be discarded. We've got to, as consumers, understand that we are all part of it as well. And our consumption habits have to change tremendously and so this is the challenge let's go for what is the heart of our problem of course we have to lobby for this and that and we have to get change but we need real transformational change and for me the groups that still can show us what it is to live in a different relationship with mother earth are indigenous people around the world they lived in place and they tell me, after all that's been done to them, they tell me, and it moves me to tears every time they say, look, we're all in the same canoe. We have to learn to paddle together. That after all we in the, in the colonizing people have done to them, they still cling to that and they're still willing to share. And that's the opportunity that we face today. Thank you. Woo!